material, background material. You can okay. do it at your leisure. Or we, we do have a copy machine, too, that we can... Uh, I can leave the whole thing. These yeah. are copies. Okay. okay. All right. This is an interview at the Days Inn, Hicksville, New York, um, 15th of July, 2003, approximately noon. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give us your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My full name is Carl, that's spelled with a K. That's the story behind that one. Initial is L, last name is Hyman. <coughs> that's H-E-I-M-A-N. Okay, and where were you born, please? I was born in Germany. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> when did you come to the United States? Two weeks before World War II broke out. I was 15 years old then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just in time. What do you mean, just in time? Well, <laughs> I couldn't volunteer yet. I couldn't volunteer because I was not even a citizen. Mm -hmm. I wanted to fight the Nazis, obviously, because we lost 22 children women and men during the Holocaust, during the Nazi era. And I was very anxious to fight against the Nazis. But after Pearl Harbor, everybody went that way, the mm -hmm. other way. Mm -hmm. And I fought World War II as a teenager from Australia all the way to Hiroshima, Japan, mm -hmm. and every place in between practically. Did, did you uh, volunteer for the army then? I couldn't volunteer yet because I wasn't a citizen. Mm -hmm. I wanted to volunteer. Mm -hmm. But I had to wait until I was drafted. Mm -hmm. And they drafted me and uh, out in Long Island, Camp Upton, which was uh, famous from World War I still. Mm -hmm. And uh, they shipped me down to Georgia for basic training, Camp Wheeler. And I could hardly understand these people because they had a southern, such a deep southern accent. And after basic training... Now, did you speak English when you... I couldn't right. speak a word of English when I came here, mm -hmm. but uh, realized they realized immediately this kid can't speak English. We'll stick him into a German class in James Monroe High School in the Bronx. Using reverse psychology, stick him in a German class, which he knows, he'll pick up English. And it did work, mm -hmm. yes. I mm -hmm. picked up English quite well. I spoke English fairly well, still with a very strong accent, which I hopefully lost meanwhile. And they sent me down to Georgia not knowing which way I'm going to go, to Europe or to, to the Pacific. But mm -hmm. after Pearl Harbor, there was no more question. You went that way, Pacific. We shipped out from San Francisco. Now, what kind of specific basic training? Did you have anything specific or...? Infantry only. Only. Mm -hmm. Infantry only. <coughs> Doing still bayonet training, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I think was absolutely antique, not to be used. And the rifles, the first rifles they gave us were leftovers from World War I Springfield rifles, which they changed later to the M1, mm -hmm. which was the up-to-date rifle at that time. Today, even that is fully mechanic. And uh, when the question arose, what are we going to do with this kit? Europe or Pacific? The Japanese solved the problem for us, Pacific. And they shipped us out to Australia from San Francisco, and a former Hawaiian cruise ship, the Matsonia, which was uh, rebuilt into a troop transport, mm -hmm. which was stacked fairly heavy, all alone, not in a convoy, for the simple reason the ship went very fast, and we zigzagged all the way by ourselves to Australia, Brisbane, Australia. I was never in Australia. The Australians were extremely happy to see us. The Japanese already started bombing Port Darwin, which is on the west coast of Australia, because the Japanese had all of the East Indies, better known today as Indonesia, and they bombed the hell out of it. And the few Australians who were fighting the war were in North Africa, Tobruk, and they welcomed us with open arms and flowers and food and everything else. They were extremely happy to see us because we really saved their neck in plain English. Mm -hmm. Australia is a country the size of the United States, the continental United States, with a population, believe it or not, of less than New York City. Mm -hmm. The Japanese could have taken it by telephone. Nobody there? 
Yeah. <laughs> and after a short time, we went to a former Australian army camp preparing for the trip north. And from Australia, we went to New Guinea around Milne Bay, Finchhafen, which was a former German colony where I even saw some tombstones still in German when German Germany was the leader the the colony that they owned in New Guinea from Finchhafen all the way along the coast we made landings and from New Guinea we went to part of the Dutch East Indies Bieg Island, Wakti Island which were ferocious battles our casualties in the Pacific was horrible the war in Europe was terrible but the war in the Pacific was absolutely brutal mm -hmm. we took no prisoners very few Americans are aware that we shot them all we took no prisoners because we realized immediately the few prisoners that the Japanese took they, they, they made short shrift out of the use of bayonet practice mm -hmm. they wounded them they hit them they treated them like dirt and the order came down forget the prisoners we took over Wakti and Bag Biak Island, very heavy casualties in the landings. And from there we went to the Philippines, the southern Philippines, Mindanao Island, which has more non Christians, Muslims than Christians, even though the Filipinos are mostly Christians. Mm -hmm. The southern Philippines are not. We took Mindanao and it was a fierce battle. The Japs even blew up a mountain that we were on, lock, stock, and parrot, blew the whole top off. And we went down to the Sulu Archipelago, towards Indonesia, towards uh, Sumatra, and towards uh, Java Island. And then we, after we cleaned that up, the order came, let's get ready for the next invasions further north. And make a long story short, we were getting ready for the invasion of Japan and they told us in plain English, I remember that very well, just like today, Big Chief told us, General, we're going to invade Japan, Honshu and Kyushu Island first, the main two islands, and we expect one million American casualties in killed in action, wounded in action, and missing in action. After hearing that, we weren't so anxious anymore to go to Japan. And we were getting ready onto the ships. And all of a sudden, the atomic bomb fell on Hiroshima. And we didn't know what the hell they're talking about. Until they explained it to us. The atomic bomb, something very new, unheard of. And the Japanese did not surrender after the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. The Americans dropped the second bomb. And Nagasaki. And the Japanese were just as puzzled as we were. They didn't know what it was until we explained it to them. And after the bomb fell on Nagasaki, they decided to surrender. We have no counter measure against this. The Japanese did surrender. We were absolutely jubilant. Those two atomic bombs saved hundreds of thousands of American lives and millions of Japanese lives. I want to emphasize that because nobody ever mentions that. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have dropped them. Those two atomic bombs saved a hell of a lot more lives than we would have had had we had to invade the place. Japanese especially. Millions of Japanese were saved. And my experience in World War II and I have to say that I'm lucky, very lucky. As a matter of fact, when we left Australia to go north for the various beach landings, I was on eight beach landings, believe it or not. Our casualty rate was horrendous. Of the 205 men, we had about 205 men for a company. Out of the 205, after the landings along the Guinea coast, Dutch East Indies coast, Philippines, the casualty list, the original men that were left were 46. Out of 205, 
46 of the originals were left. This gives you an idea of how brutal the war in the Pacific was. The Japanese were fanatics, absolute fanatics. But we had constantly replacements coming in to compensate for the losses. I'm ready for a few questions if you have them. Otherwise, I'll show you some of the details I have here. Okay. Um, do you recall um, hearing about the death of President Roosevelt yes. and your reaction to yes. that? We were very sorry to hear about the death, but since he lived to a ripe old age, and the t they told us Harry Truman, he said, who? Harry Truman is his successor. But the first few steps, the first few moves that Harry Truman made were very impressive during the war. And uh, we settled for Harry Truman, mm -hmm. and uh, we had great respect for him. He meant what he said, and said what he meant. What were the relations within your unit uh, with the replacements? Well, when the replacements came in, of course, we as the old-timers looked down upon them. But the minute we went into combat, we were evenly divided. Everybody helped everybody. And uh, it was very cooperative in all directions. We constantly had replacements coming in to replace and we told them, as older veterans, we told them exactly how to behave, what to do, what not to do, and how brutal the Japanese are not to take prisoners, which of course they followed in line. As a matter of fact, I'm Jewish. I was born Jewish, one of the few German Jews who made it. Germany never, more, never had more than about less than 1% of Jews when they heard, when I, mean, I told them I'm Jewish, they said, what? Jewish? Did you mean any Jews? And this fellow I was talking to says, Carl, you're the first brave Jew I ever met. Well, how many Jews did you meet? None. <laughs> Which was typical mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. he, is a, he is a southerner, a southern kid, who was also a very good fighter, and uh, commended me because I'm a brave Jew, but I never met any Jews. But the question in combat especially is, it's either you or him. Mm -hmm. And if you fast, and think and do the right thing, you'll come out ahead. Were you, uh, you were obviously under MacArthur. I was obviously under MacArthur. Well, how, what were your feelings about MacArthur? Well, our feelings about MacArthur were, he was known as a prima donna. MacArthur, of course, could do no wrong. He was in love with himself. And I'm sure the few uh, TV shows, or the two TV uh, news reels that we saw of him wading ashore were well practiced and well rehearsed. Our regard was when MacArthur uh, said about the Philippines, I shall return, famous for that saying, I shall return to the Philippines, of course. We promptly, all of us, promptly translated it, stick to Mac, you'll never get back, which of course was true. MacArthur fought to the very end and Harry Truman even made him fight in Korea, mm -hmm. put him in charge, but fired him and put in Ridgeway after. Our respect for MacArthur was minimal because the local generals and the generals we had, the real fighters on the front lines were unlike MacArthur. They were our buddies. Our officers did not live very long, very short life, within a matter of days at the most a week or two. They were killed in combat. Any officer. And here's what transpired in the Battle of Bacti Island, which was horrible. The lieutenant was dead, the sergeant was badly wounded, and the company commander comes over to me and says, Carl, you're it. It was a PFC then, private first class, which is automatic from private private first class. And the next thing I know, it was a sergeant. I wasn't even a corporal, but the sergeant and it took over. In other words, a battlefield promotion, and I felt very honored, and I made, made uh, what shall I say, made good use of it, and I used my soldiers, my people, protectively and offensively at the right time. But you have to make sure it's the right time, because the Japanese were extremely ruthless 
extremely ruthless. You can always expect the unexpected from them. If you fought in the Pacific, you know, they always did the wrong thing at the wrong time against us, the unexpected one. When did you, uh, <clears throat> now you received the Purple Heart. Yes. Where did, where were you? Here's what happened. It was really a shrapnel. The Japanese bombed the hell out of us and sent in, uh, they had no rockets then, sent shells, artillery shells. It was from a artillery shell spectacle, an artillery shell, a shell, a, a crash seam and exploded. I got some here on my neck still which they ducked it up immediately and kept on fighting and I uh, lost one of my thumbnails. But it was not that effective. I was still able to fight and I did. They gave me the Purple Heart and meanwhile a lot of other decorations. And you received the Bronze Star or did you receive? The Bronze Star? Star? That's for, that was I think automatic because <laughs> either they had great respect or they knew these guys were fighting so hard and so many landings that do deserve some kind of recognition and they gave us the bronze star. All the frontline fighters at the time received the bronze star. That was towards the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Now you were mentioned uh, here that you were one of the first into Hiroshima after the yes. surrender. What, okay. was, yes. what was your impression As, and what was that like? Here's what happened. The, our, the, our transports, which were supposed to take us to Japan to fight, to land, became troop ships to land, period. And the first thing I noticed about the Japanese, no weapons at all anymore. Evidently the order came through, got rid of them completely. And they were still there, the Japanese, but not with weapons. They kept on bowing and bowing and bowing and anything and everything, they kept on bowing. The Japanese are a bunch of bowers. And I finally told them, stop bowing, forget it. And they were very accommodating. They put us even in Japanese marine barracks, which by American standards were extremely primitive, very primitive. And we stayed there and slept there and lived there for quite some time. And even though they were primitive by, Jap by our standards, they were not primitive by Japanese standards. The Japanese as such, especially the females, were extremely cooperative, the females. And the males were out of respect that we won cooperative. They couldn't do enough for us. When we came first to Japan, they were so eager to please us. Anything you asked them, and they couldn't speak the language, and they couldn't speak our language. We did a lot of hand maneuvering by hand. But uh, they also learned English fairly fast because we didn't had no intention of learning Japanese, mm -hmm. and they did usually what we asked them to do. They were extremely cooperative. I have no complaints about that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how long were you in Japan? Uh, it was a few months. We landed in the summer, and about two or three months later, the order came. The longer you were in the army, the faster you were able to go home. And uh, I finally got home. We landed again in San Francisco. We shipped out from Seattle, landed in San Francisco. And they welcomed us as the conquerors and the victors, of course. And I was lucky that I was still alive because of the heavy casualties we had. But uh, all in all, I don't regret one thing I did in World War II against the Japanese, even I would have liked to fight against the Germans. Since I speak German fluently, that was also American mentality, because I speak German fluently, mm -hmm. does everybody fight the Japs? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. But in those days, everybody automatically after Pearl Harbor, that way. When Pearl Harbor happened, I was still in school, in high school, in Point Pleasant Beach, New Jersey. We lived near Lakewood, but the school district was Point Pleasant Beach and the Japanese bombed the hell out of Pearl Harbor and again completely flabbergasted by it but I was so anxious to join I couldn't join I had to wait until I was drafted. 
the casualty rate in Pearl Harbor was also uncalled for and it was not, not according to Army, unexpected. They just weren't, didn't, didn't know where they're going to attack us. They thought Whig Island or Guam or uh, one of the other islands in the Pacific. Wrong. Pearl Harbor. The Japanese gained a tremendous victory by bombing Pearl Harbor and we let them. Unopposed. Unopposed. Absolute disgrace. Our intelligence was either very poor or not up to snuff. How did you feel <clears throat> when you were aware, when were you aware of the, the existence of the concentration camps in Europe and how did you feel being Jewish and a German? Well, believe it or not, my father, who was politically very astute and very active, survived Dachau concentration camp. Well, he, was, he, was, he survived it. As a matter of well, fact... who came over then? My father, my mother and I. One brother was in Argentina, one other brother was in Palestine, which later became Israel. Mm -hmm. I came with them. I was the youngest. I was born post-World War II. One, they were born pre-World War I. Mm -hmm. They were 10, 14 mm -hmm. years older than I. But uh, we were very much aware of the concentration camps under the Nazis. Hitler made no, no bones about it. Mm -hmm. He was anxious to get rid of the Jews. I do a lot of public speaking before, during and after. And of what transpired in those years. And a question I was asked once by a Korean American girl, not an American girl, not a German girl, I do a lot of public speaking in Germany to the Germans today. She asked me point blank, why did Hitler pick on the Jews? Very good question. Why did Hitler pick on the Jews? Why the Jews? I, as a matter of fact, when I ask questions to the audience, how many Jews do you think were in Germany when Hitler came to power? There were 60 million Germans when Hitler came to power. Today there were about 20, 20, more, 20 million more, 80 million. Out of those 60 million Germans when Hitler came to power, less than 1% were Jewish, 500,000. Negligible, next to nothing. But why did Hitler pick on the Jews? For two basic reasons. First of all, in a total dictatorship a la Hitler, who told the German what they love to hear, he's going to get revenge and he's going to make a great empire again, etc., etc., etc. You need two basics. You need, a, you need a, an egomaniac. You need a demigod who can do no wrong himself, obviously, and somebody with the blame on. They're at fault. They did it. They always have done it. We have to get rid of them, the Jews. You have it since biblical times to modern times, anti-Semitism, anti-Jewishness. And that's exactly how it went. And it was progressively worse. We lost not only our homes, our businesses, our profession. We became stateless. We, let, we lost everything. Before the war broke out, Hitler says, just get out. Everything stays here. Just get out. Many people don't realize that. But we made it. And the problem here with this country was disinterested. You had immigration quotas. My father finally realized in 1936, that's three years into Hitler, something's very wrong here, we can, we can, we're not going to get rid of this guy. And we registered for an American immigration quota number. We registered for Argentina, we registered for probably any other country that may or may not accept this. United States gave us a quota number, 1936. That quota number was not called until two weeks before the World War II broke out in 1939. That's uh, six years later, after 36, well, three years later, I'm sorry, after the war broke out, and we just made it by the skin of our teeth and I fought World War II in the American Army. America was under, after the great Franklin Delano Roosevelt did absolutely nothing for the Jews. As a matter of fact, when he called the conference in Evian, which is on the Swiss-French border. What can we do to help the Jews? And he invited all the countries from North America, South America, the ones in Europe which were not invaded yet, and they all came. Well, we have unemployment, we have regression, we have depression, we have no money. The best we can do is give them our sympathy. Absolutely nothing was accomplished. Only one country 
one country volunteered to take a couple of thousand Jews, the Dominican Republic was the only country and the Trujillo that accepted a couple of thousand Jews. The rest, so sorry, did not. Hitler also had an observer there who reported back to headquarters in Berlin. And Hitler was jubilant. I told you nobody wants the Jews. I'll do something about it. And he did. Kristallnacht. When all the Jewish men in the middle of the night in our place doorbell rings. Two o'clock in the morning in the Yerman's home, my mother and I. Doorbell rings. And my mother was about to open up. Didn't have to bother. Here come these Nazis crashing through the door looking for my father. Luckily he was not at home. My mother told him he's not here. He's on a business trip. Didn't believe her. They went all over the place looking for him. They made a shambles out of him. Wrecked the joint. And everything was exactly what we told him. He's not here. They couldn't find him. He wasn't there. So they decided, well, let's look for anti-state material. Anti-state material. Anti-Nazi material. We have plenty of that. Books, manuscripts, speeches my father held. And they finally carted it off in big cards and took off. And went next door. Another Jewish home. And they were so frust frustrated they shot father and son on the spot and killed them both. And this went on all over town. The next day my father did come home. Did come home. They spotted him. They grabbed him. Sent him into Dachau concentration camp. The word concentration camp is a misnomer. It's torture camp, killing camp, extermination camp. It has nothing to do with concentration whatsoever. But they grabbed so many Jews, they literally had no room for them. Had no room for them. They couldn't sleep them all over the place. They had to stack them like a bunch of boxes together. And about a couple of months later, my father came home. There he was. That's where are you from? Well, they let us go with the admonition. They had no room for us, first of all. They had too many. The next time we catch you with family and you will not get out. This was the admonition they told them. Mm -hmm. But we were so anxious to leave Germany, we had to wait for our immigration quota number, the American immigration quota number to be called, and it just we just made it two weeks before the war broke out with nothing. We're lucky we're here. That was the first one. But World War II... I'm lucky I'm here. When you uh, returned from service, did you make use of the GI Bill? Yes, I did. My father, this is typical European mentality. I wanted to go to university, college, learn a trade. So I learned a trade, became a machinist under the GI Bill in New Jersey. I to learn a trade. I retired from Sears Roebuck and Company about uh, 10 years ago as a manager. I was with them about almost 30 years. I did very well at Sears. I have no complaints. I started as a salesman and then worked my way up. Did you ever use the 5220 Club? No. no. <laughs> did you ever, did you join any veterans organizations? Yes. I joined the DAV, Disabled American Veterans, as a lifetime member. They still sent me literature and the Jewish war veterans mm -hmm. because they did not get enough recognition. Everybody looked down upon the Jews. Anti-Semitism, even though I did not encounter anti-Semitism in the U.S. Army, I only found pro-Jewishness in the American Army. I was determined not to have happened here, what happened in Germany, do my share. Um, did you uh, ever stay in contact with anyone that you served? Yes, I did. With about three or four Southern boys, Middle Westerners, Far Westerners, but they're all dead now. They died. I was a teenager, remember. These yes. guys were older. Yeah. And they're all dead now. Mm -hmm. I had very good correspondence with them. Did you ever go to any reunions or anything? I never did because the 41st Combat Infantry Division, their home is in the far west, mm -hmm. Washington, Oregon. And it's just too far. Sometimes they have a little closer 
reunions, but I could not travel to a reunion mm -hmm. for the simple reason, time and expenses. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? My time in the service changed my life in such a way I became more outspoken and I lost a lot, if not all, of my shyness. I was a very shy little guy. And I became much more outspoken for everybody's rights. I don't care who it was, especially minorities. And I still feel the same way. My mind was opened up, widened. My expense, expanse increased. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you're quite welcome.